Hey everybody, I am back with another decade ranking video and today I'm going to be ranking the 15 major main titles, um, main titles, no pun intended, released in the 2010s. Um, as the, the first part of Stephen King's career, it just seems like he had one iconic hit after another, especially now with the passage of time. Um, books like The Stand, Salem's Lot, Shining, Carrie, Cujo, Firestarter, Christine, they all, um, they all stand as true like milestone moments in his career, which to the casual observer might lead one to believe that his, his best days occurred in the 70s and 80s. And in terms of his writing and in terms of his storytelling, I would say that that is far from true in terms of what what has become iconic in the pop culture um, that that may be true. But for people, for the constant readers who look forward to every new Stephen King release, um, you know that his writing, if you if you feel like I do, his writing has just gotten better as he's gotten older. And I when I did the ranking of the the '90s. There's a few highlights in the 90s. Um, overall, I would say it was definitely a step down in quality from the 80s, which also had some inconsistencies. And the 2000s was kind of the same as he recovered from his near-death experience in 1999. There were some real hit-or-miss moments in the 2000s as well. And um, there, have, there haven't really been any highlights for me yet in the 2020s. But going back and looking, making the list of the 2010s and then ranking them, it is truly, in my opinion, one of his most consistent decades of all time. And that has given me the idea for another video at some point in the future, ranking the decades themselves. Um, the 2010s, so I made this list, 15 titles. And of the 15, I would consider 13 of them to be you know, easy recommendations uh, for fans of Stephen King. You should you should check these books out. And let's see, out of the fifteen, I would consider six, maybe seven, to be Stephen King classics, which is I don't know. Other than the seventies, which which hardly counts. Um, is one of the best ratios of of total titles and classics that of any decade in Stephen King's career. So anyway, without further ado, let's let's get into it. Ranking the 2010s. So the place to start for me is very simple. In the 2010s, at number 15, the bottom of the list, I put Elevation, which despite the fact that it's it's teeny tiny just so much smaller than your standard novel. It is listed as a novel when it is um, very clearly either a long short story or a novella, it's still listed as a novel. And it had a list price of $20, which is pretty high for, for what you get. There's nothing wrong with the story. The story is fine. I think it's just almost like Blockade Billy. It's just one of those underwhelming releases that it's just really easy to just get, to just skim over um, because it, this was not the only book in the year that it was released. I think there was at least one other and it just kind of, you know, like blink and you miss it and you're on to the next thing. So at the bottom of the list, I put Elevation. Not to say it's a bad story, just to say that it is um, pretty easily forgotten in the mad rush of the 2010s. Coming in at number 14, I put Stephen King's first collaboration with Richard Chismar, Gwendy's Button Box. Um, this story, I, I feel, is very modest, and but it is, it is an interesting idea, and it's thought-provoking. It's far from a classic, but in terms of the Gwendy trilogy, which I will do its own video about someday. Gwendy's Button Box is by far the standout title of that trilogy. The second book was written only by Richard Chismar, and I don't know, the, le the, least, the less said about that, the better. And then the final book did have Stephen King's name on it, but comes across almost like 
just complete and utter Stephen King fan service, which Stephen King may have been part of. Anyway, I digress. That's for another day. Gwendy's Button Box, the first of the trilogy, it's a decent story, um, but it is it it does not stand out as one of the one of the most important works of the 2010s or one of the most important works of Stephen King's career. So it comes in at number 14. At number 13, starting with the part of the list, as I mentioned at the beginning, that are easy recommends to anybody who's interested in Stephen King. From here on out, everything on this list is worth reading. And in some case, in some ways, uh, ranking this list was challenging because of the overall decent quality of the work. But coming in at number 13, I put the story collection, The Bazaar of Bad Dreams. There's nothing wrong with it, um, but I know for some people, the short stories really resonate. But for me personally, just there's so much diminished impact in the shorter package as opposed to the novels that, that I inhabit and live with for so long that the short story collections kind of get the short end of the stick um, because they, they just don't linger in the memory quite as much. Anyway, number 13, The Bazaar of Bad Dreams. One of the really unique and interesting accomplishments that Stephen King had in the 2010s was a trilogy of books that are, they owe just as much to like the police procedural as they do to straight up suspense and horror. And that's the Bill Hodges trilogy. Um, definitely one of the highlights to me of Stephen King's entire career and really, really exciting that um, in his I, 40 years in, 40 years into his career, um, he sparked on this new idea and these new characters that obviously really, really resonated with him and, and, and produced this really unique trilogy. But coming in at number 12, I put the third book in the trilogy, End of Watch. This does wrap up the entire trilogy, and it, and it does it in, in decent style, um, but it is the most far-fetched of the, of the trilogy, which is saying a lot because they all um, require you to suspend disbelief in, in some, some way, as is typical with a Stephen King novel. But End of Watch just comes across as Stephen King, in some ways, trying to finish the trilogy um, and having to stretch a little bit more than he did in the first two books to make that happen. Again, not to say it's bad. Bill Hodges' trilogy, definitely a highlight of Stephen King's career, and the entire trilogy is worth reading. But in the context of this list, End of Watch comes in at number 12. Coming in at number 11, I put Stephen King's collaboration with his son Owen, Sleeping Beauties. I listened to this book on audio and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I found it to be, it was a really interesting idea, very gripping, and to me, well, well produced, um, well thought out, and the entire thing was really interesting. Um, so surprisingly to me, uh, I started realizing, I saw discussions about Sleeping Beauties and read comments that other people just absolutely detest, detest this book. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. Um, I really enjoyed it. Again, I didn't read it. I listened to it on audio, and that may have made all the difference. So, if you have started Sleeping Beauties and you gave up on it because you just couldn't stand it, and you are interested in trying again, I would highly recommend trying the audiobook instead because um, I really liked it. But anyway, Sleeping Beauties, interesting idea. To me, well well presented, but I know that it's a very hit or miss proposition. So coming in at number 11, Sleeping Beauties. So imagine my surprise, just like everyone else's surprise. Seemingly, the, the Dark Tower series is, is done, it's wrapped up. Stephen King said at that time in 2004-ish that he was going to retire because he was freaking exhausted, and no one can blame him for that. And he didn't retire, of course. He kept writing, he kept publishing, um, but I certainly did not expect him to revisit the world of the Dark Tower at any point. So I was very surprised and delighted and a little skeptical, I will admit, when he published The Wind Through the Keyhole. 
And it was only just in the last few years that I, I um, actually listened to The Wind Through the Keyhole for the very first time. And I really like it. Um, it's, it's an interesting story. It, it's put together very interestingly. And um, it doesn't, it, it has very little of the, you know, the, the present story of the Dark Tower um, Roland and the Cotet as they are, you know, making their way through Midworld to Endworld to get to the Dark Tower, it's it's mostly flashbacks and flashbacks inside of flashbacks. It's a literary turducken. And um, I got a real kick out of it. It's It fits just perfectly right in with the Dark Tower series at, at um, book 4.5, uh, technically. And it makes me, it makes me hope that Stephen King goes back to that world and, and writes another Dark Tower story at some point in the future. Now, some people just swear on their life that that will indeed, in fact, happen, but who knows? And Stephen King is 75 years old, um, I think, or he may have already turned 76, but um, shame on me for not knowing that off the top of my head. Anyway, all that to say, we'll, we'll see. Um, there will be water if Ka wills it. But anyway, coming in at number 10, The Wind Through the Keyhole. One of the characters that was introduced in the Bill Hodges trilogy um, apparently just really uh, struck a chord with Stephen King because he's gone back to this character multiple times um, since the Bill Hodges trilogy, and she's now got her own series of books, and that is Holly Gibney. And to me, the best Holly book outside of the Bill Hodges trilogy, which aren't really Holly books per se, um, but the best... Holly book is The Outsider. Um, it, it, gets, it gets spooky. It gets really weird, um, which is not bad. Uh, a lot of Stephen King gets spooky and really weird, and that's perfectly fine. Um, one of the things that stands out to me about The Outsider is actually the beginning. Um, there's When Stephen King, like you can tell, if a, an idea, a scene, something just really sparks his imagination, he can set a scene like nobody else and draw out the suspense and see the fine details and just build and build and build the foreshadowing and just the, the dread and the suspense. And there's um, a scene outside of a courthouse at the beginning of The Outsider that I think is an absolute masterpiece. I know the rest of the story, it goes all over the place um, and it, it's a bit far-fetched, but it's still very, very enjoyable. And it comes in at number nine on my list of ranking the 2010s. I've gone on record as saying that I'm not a big fan of the Colorado Kid. It's it's incredibly um, half baked to me. It's a mystery with no resolution, and I it's it's just not it's just not not great. It's it's quite underwhelming. So I was a bit worried and a bit suspicious when Stephen King announced that he was. Um, releasing another book on the hard case crime imprint. I was hoping that it would not be another Colorado kid and, and it was not, it is, it is an exceptional, modest, you know, B level Stephen King. And that is Joyland. Um, it's as, as a setting, it has a haunted amusement park or maybe just an amusement park. That's really run down and creepy, which I absolutely love. Um, there's a, a subplot about young love and it's just, it's, it's very enjoyable. It's very gripping. It's spooky. It's haunting. It's, it's scary. It's romantic. It's, it's all of the things that the Colorado kid, um, was not. And out of the three hard case crime books, uh, Colorado kid, Joyland, and later Joyland to me is far and away the best one. It comes in at number eight on my list from the 2010s. A while back, I did a video of the most underrated Stephen King books of all time. And to me, I think a lot of the reason that a book ends up underrated, at least in my opinion, is that he, like clockwork, he's releasing books, at least one per year, sometimes more than one, um, more than one per year. This year, 2024, Looks like it's shaping up to be a two book year, which is fantastic. Um, and this book 
it ended up on my list of the most underrated simply because I think it just falls victim to that, that really intense schedule. Um, the books get released and then before they can really catch on, especially if there's no TV adaptation, no movie adaptation, eminent when the book is released, it's so easy for it to just get, get lost in the wake of, of the momentum of everything that comes after. Anyway, all that to say, um, coming in at number seven on my list, I put the Institute. Now the Institute, um, in a lot of ways, it strikes at some chords that it's almost like Stephen King's greatest hits in terms of plot elements. There's Young People, which immediately makes me think of the Losers Club in It. There's secret government um, stuff going on, which reminds me of, of The Shop from Firestarter. There's some psychic stuff going on, which makes me think of The Breakers from, uh, from the Dark Tower series. So, but it's not... Um, it's better. It's greater than the sum of its parts. And it's, it's really compelling. And um, even though Stephen King, as he's gotten older, arguably writes young people uh, less convincingly, which only makes sense um, as the farther he gets from his own youth, I found the characters in the Institute to be um, interesting, compelling. I had nothing glaringly stood out to me as like, that's not the way that young people in that situation would act. Um, I found the book very gripping and I just, I don't think that it gets the love that it deserves. So I'm, I want to reiterate again on another video that if you haven't read the Institute, it is well worth picking up. Definitely. Um, if not a Stephen King classic, at least a really, really strong and underrated Stephen King story coming in at number seven, the Institute. So coming in at number six, I put the first book from the Bill Hodges trilogy, Mr. Mercedes. Um, this book, ha it starts with a bang with seemingly something ripped from the headlines, um, vehicular homicide, um, and then it just goes into this. So for me, I, I was not expecting the police type of police procedural aspects, even though there's some supernatural aspects, there's definitely some horror aspects to this book. Um, the, the retired, like grizzled down on his luck, um, kind of depressed police investigator was, was unexpected for me uh, in terms of, in terms of a main character. And I just, I really found Bill Hodges to be endearing. I grew to really like him as a character and Mr. Mercedes. This is one of those where Stephen King just does such an exceptional job ratcheting up the suspense and setting the stage and the foreshadowing for what inevitably, for what eventually happens. And it, it truly has one of the most, one of the most elaborate, most brilliantly wrought um, climactic scenes in any Stephen King book. Highly, highly recommended. Um, for some reason, this is another one that, while it seems very obviously high quality to me, um, not everyone enjoys it. What are you going to do? Um, it does introduce us to uh, uh, an entire universe of characters that are now have now been featured in at, at least six stories or novels in the Stephen King universe um, because Holly has carried on the, the storyline um, from the Bill Hodges trilogy, and she's now having adventures of her very own. But anyway, it all started here, coming in at number six on my list, Mr. Mercedes. It's easy to stereotype Stephen King. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the books from the 70s and the 80s, they all stand out. Very iconic, um, very grisly, very horrific. He became the king of horror for a reason. And it's easy to stereotype that as he's gone on, as he's gotten older, he has just generally mellowed out. And I, I do believe that his, his interest and, and the scope of his works encompasses all kinds of things. Horror um, is just one flavor in, in the crazy, mad literary stew of Stephen King. But that's not to say that he can't still pull out all the stops when he chooses to. And while he's generally optimistic and upbeat and his books 
you know, they don't always have like a universally happy ending, but they usually end on a note of hope. Um, book number five goes to some dark places and kind of hangs out there and just expresses um, to me some pessimism about human nature itself and and religious belief and just belief in general. And I, I was I found it really compelling. I found it really surprising. Book number five on the list is Revival. The idea of the um, uh, the priest, the religious, the religious character who loses his faith. Um, that's very intriguing to me. And I couldn't help but think that there might be some autobiographical aspects to that. Um, there's some scenes in Revival that stick in the memory. Very surprising, very compelling, very dark, and um, to me, definitely a Stephen King classic. A late career, but overall Stephen King classic. Coming in at number five, Revival. So coming in at number four is a book that was, you know, in terms of all the books that I, I didn't know much about, didn't have high hopes for, and that really surprised me, this book is right up there toward the top of that list of books that I, I didn't quite know what to expect, but it completely defied my expectations and totally exceeded them. So coming in at number four, I put the middle book in the Bill Hodges trilogy, Finders Keepers. Um, it, it has a lot to say about book collecting and just the mad lengths that some collectors will go to to possess certain things. Um, I certainly could relate to, to aspects of that. Um, I, after Mr. Mercedes, I was expecting another sort of um, whodunit, mystery, uh, police type thing. And Bill Hodges is in it. Uh, don't get me wrong. And Holly and, and everybody. But um, just the, the plot itself was so unexpected and reminded me a lot of, of the story of, of J.D. Salinger who didn't publish for decades, but the rumor had it that, that he never stopped writing. And the mind sort of boggles as to what, what treasures his estate may be, may be sitting on. And Finders Keepers talks about sort of what would happen if collectors just took it upon themselves to basically stop waiting. And they convinced themselves that they had a right to this person's unpublished work because they are they are collectors and and fans it's really really interesting and unexpected storyline um i thoroughly enjoyed it i highly recommend it very very underrated book in my opinion um coming in at number four finders keepers well stephen king has a handful of a, a small group of novella specifically novella collections in his career probably the, the best and most famous is the first one, Different Seasons, from 1982. Um, Four Past Midnight is another one that came out at maybe one of the very lowest points of Stephen King's entire career, um, and definitely not, not a classic in my estimation. But I was surprised and delighted and just... It, I, was in, I was on the edge of my seat the entire time reading the four novellas in the collection, Full Dark, No Stars. There are supernatural aspects to these stories, but what surprised me most was how sort of gritty and realistic um, the stories tended to be. Um, in particular, uh, the story Big Driver, which is, I mean, and it's gritty, almost reminded me of sort of Jack Ketchum, of, of there's this cruelty, and and twisted sick people doing horrible things and it was just seemingly a real a real change of pace and even though stephen king is you know well into his career into the twilight of his career perhaps he he had this idea and he he handled it masterfully and just viciously and i absolutely absolutely was on the edge of my seat um a good marriage is another example of just it's, hor it's horrifying. It's terrifying. It's really, really scary, but it, it's completely different than anything else that um, I can remember Stephen King having written. And it's all about the fear that you have, like a very domestic fear that the person you've shared your life with, 
for however many years is, and you think you know inside and out is actually a completely different person than, than who you actually think them to be. Really unique, very, very well done, very well handled. And I just, I can't say enough good things about this collection. Um, if, you've, if you've passed it over for some reason, there's some adaptations that have come out of the stories from this. Um, the novellas are just the perfect length for adaptation in movie form. Um, and Full Dark No Stars definitely sprouted forth some really cool adaptations. But if you've not read the originals, highly recommend it. Number three, Full Dark No Stars. So the top two spots is kind of a toss up. And in fact, I had, I have my book set out here. I have my list. And just a few minutes ago, I was looking at these final two books and I switched the order. Um, depending on the day, it could kind of go either way. But both of these books are books that I would consider to be Stephen King classics. Even though casual observers, casual readers um, may have kind of tuned out after the giant epic pop culture milestones of the 70s and 80s, Stephen King is still, is still, he can still bring the heat uh, and more often, more often than you might expect. Coming in at number two, um, and like I said, 20 minutes ago, this was number one. Now it's number two. It's really debatable, even to me in my head. I, I literally have debates about this stuff that sometimes keep me up at night. I'm not going to lie. Um, but Stephen King's historical novel, 112263, I'm putting at number two. This is a book that got a lot of notoriety and a lot of publicity when it was released, which was really, really nice. Um, it's a book that would appeal to, um, you know, broader than your average constant reader, you know, like people that don't even read Stephen King might be interested in reading 112263. And it's also um, a stylistic deviation for Stephen King in that it's, it's based on historical fact. And you can't fudge facts like the amount of research, the amount of study, the amount of careful fact checking and detail work that had to go into this book is truly remarkable. And Stephen King often has talked about how he, he tries not to overly plot out or outline his stories. He just gets in and he starts writing and, and the muse takes him where it takes him. And sometimes where, where the story ends up is a surprise even to him. Well, one of the biggest feats in 112263 is that by its very nature, it had to be plotted out. It had to be outlined because it's dealing with things, verifiable facts that actually happen. And for, for fans more of JFK, conspiracy theories, American history, etc., he had to get those right. Otherwise, those people would cry foul. What's remarkable about 112263 is that within and around the confines of that research and that fact that fact based historical writing Stephen King manages to create a very very compelling fictional story um, it kind of made me think in an odd way of Titanic right so there's this real thing that you you know at least you know partially how it's going to turn out, but there's this fictitious love story at the heart of it that, that draws you in and makes kind of the impact of, of the true historical aspect all the more palpable because it's going to impact these two people in particular that you've really come to know and care about. 112263 also um, scratches the what if itch in a major way. Uh, so the entire the entire premise of the book, which I'm sure you know, it's it's already um, it's already quite famous and well known just in pop culture itself. There was a, an excellent adaptation um, a few years back. Is that a man goes back in time to prevent the assassination of JFK, assuming that that will that that will make the world an overall better place. If JFK had lived, um, everything would have been 
well, maybe not, you know, not everything would have been coming up roses, but it could have been better um, than what we ended up with. And Stephen King did a lot of research, talked to a lot of people, political historians, about their, their opinions about what would have happened in America had JFK lived. And that's one of the coolest things that 112263 does, is it really just dives in to that what if question. Um, you know, what if JFK had lived? And the results are interesting, <laughs> to say the least. The results are, are kind of scary and, and haunting. And one of the, um, one of the big takeaways for me from 112263 is that as sad as I feel thinking about the Kennedy assassination, as tragic a loss as it seemed to be, at least for the innocence of our country, um, you know, you never know. If he had lived, um, things could have turned out completely different and, and potentially way worse. So all that to say, coming in at number two on my list from the 2010s, 112263, hands down a stone cold overall Stephen King classic. The 2010s aren't as famous a decade in general as say the 1970s, which only had a handful of books. But if you've been keeping track, you, you know which book is at the top of the list. And like I said, this one, 112263, they hold the top two spots and they can kind of go back and forth. But number one in the 2010s, I put Dr. Sleep. What? So to me, The Shining holds the spot as the number one Stephen King book of all time. It's my absolute, hands down, personal favorite Stephen King book. And it's a lot of people's personal favorite Stephen King book. It's very, very famous. It's one of those pop culture touchstones that is relatable to millions and millions of people, generations of people. And it had an incredibly famous and controversial, at least um, in Stephen King's perspective, adaptation by Stanley Kubrick in 1980, and then a miniseries adaptation by Stephen King himself in the 90s. All this, this... This ground is very, very familiar and very well worn. So just the, the risk, the colossal, almost overwhelming risk that Stephen King took in writing a sequel to one of his earlier works. Um, there have been series, of course, the Dark Tower series, the Bill Hodges um, trilogy. There are series that feature the same characters as they progress but off the top of my head dr sleep is the first like actual sequel that stephen king has ever written and to pick one of his one of his just absolute classic novels to 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 write the sequel for just an incredible risk but it pays off brilliantly um so dr sleep catches up with Danny Torrance when, when he's an adult. And we get a lot of backstory as to what happened to Danny and Wendy and Halloran after the events of The Shining, which is really interesting um, to sort of go back and revisit that character and sort of find out what happened. Because at the end of The Shining, it does end on a positive and, and hopeful note, but there's, you know, you're just left wondering. How in the world can these people possibly put their lives back together again? Well, Dr. Sleep talks about exactly how, how they tried to do that. And then Danny grows up and he, he starts battling some very grown-up demons of his own. He joins AA, which Stephen King himself is very, very familiar with. And he gets sober and he finds a positive outlet to utilize his power while also... Um, keeping the ghost from his past securely locked away. So everything's going along. It's kind of low key. It's kind of mundane. And then there's this new group of villains. And what, what a group of villains. These are absolutely heinous characters, but in the fashion of the best villains, they are not, they are not without their endearing i'm not going to say redeeming but endearing qualities they're quirky they're strange their lives are 
bizarre. Um, there's one, one death scene in the book um, that's at the hands of this, this group of villains who call themselves the true knot is just truly, truly one of the most disturbing things in the entire Stephen King universe, which is saying one heck of a lot. But the, the true knot and Danny all, they end up um, sort of at odds with each other. There's a new young person, a much, much happier uh, child with a much happier childhood, but with powers um, equal to or potentially even greater than Danny's ever were. And her name is Abra. And the True Knot, they, they feed off psychic energy and they know that Abra's there. And Danny tries really hard to protect her and keep her safe and yada, 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 all of this. And one of the coolest things that, that Dr. Sleep achieves is that it makes you forget the shining it's it is possible i mean you remember all of it subconsciously but when i started doctor sleep i i i was on edge thinking how is this possibly going to be as good even remotely as good as the shining and that weighed on my mind but stephen king is such a talented storyteller and he had such an inspired story to tell that he he draws you in as he does in the best of his work just draws you in to a world of his creation and I found the entire thing very, um, very emotional. I found it very compelling. I, I was really, really happy that Stephen King took the chance to write the sequel. And the climactic, the climactic scenes that take place at the site the, of the, the previous site of the Overlook Hotel from the original novel, I mean, truly um, brought tears to my eyes. Very suspenseful, very scary, but then there's aspects that just bring the entire thing full circle. And I think Stephen King has said when he was writing The Shining in the character of Jack, the alcoholic, um, the aloof, the abusive, he, he was writing about himself and he didn't even realize it. Well, if that's through that lens, it's safe to say that in Dr. Sleep, um, Stephen King, as well as Danny, as well as Jack, find find closure and find redemption i think that i i may not be the most objective person when it comes to this particular book because i do love the shining so much but i think in a way that makes that made it more likely that i would absolutely detest dr sleep if he had gotten it wrong but he didn't get it wrong um it's brilliant i absolutely love it and it comes in at number one on my list of the 15 books from the 2010s, one of Stephen King's overall very best and most consistent decades to date. So let me know in the comments about um, your list. What's your number one book of the 2010s? Did I rank? Was there something on my list that I put too high? Was there something that I put too low? Do you agree with? my assessment of Dr. Sleep at number one. Is 11-22-63 overrated? Is it underrated? Let me know. Um, let me know what you think. And even though it's a, to it's a topic really for another day, let me know your thoughts on the Gwendy trilogy as well. Um, I'm going to go there at some point. Um, I'm just not quite ready yet. But I am always curious to know what other people think about, about this type of stuff. So Anyway, thank you very much for sticking with me through this lengthy list. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your support. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. All of the above. And the Stephen King collecting community, the Stephen King constant reader community is, is really that. It's a community. And there's a lot of love and support that I felt from you and um, just in general. Uh, related to related to this topic. So I really appreciate it. Um, take care of yourselves. And until next time, I will talk to you later. Bye.